Hello, my name is Marshall Kirk McCusick, and I've been around as long as dinosaurs and mainframes have ruled the world, which is to say the 60s and the 70s. However, by the 1970s, a new breed of mammals had begun to show up on the scene, known as mini-computers. Although they were just toys in the 1970s, they would soon grow and take over most of the computing market. In 1970, at AT&T Bell Laboratories, two researchers, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, began developing the Unix operating system. Ken Thompson, who'd been an alumnus at Berkeley, came back on a sabbatical in 1975, bringing Unix with him. In the year that he was there, he managed to get a number of graduate students interested in Unix, and by the time he left in 1976, Bill Joy had taken over in running the Unix system and, in fact, continuing to develop software for it. Bill began packaging up the software that had been developed under Berkeley Unix and distributing it as the Berkeley Software Distributions, whose name was quickly shortened to simply BSD. BSD continued to be distributed with yearly distributions for almost 15 years, initially under Bill Joy and later under others, including yours truly. By the late 1980s, interest had begun to grow in freely redistributable software. So a number of us at Berkeley began separating out the AT&T proprietary bits of BSD from those parts that were freely redistributable. By the time of the final distribution of BSD in 1992, the entire distribution was freely redistributable. I've only given a capsule history here, but if you're interested in the entire story, I have this three and a half hour epic, which is available from my website, www.mcusick.com, that gives the entire history at Berkeley. Following the final distribution from Berkeley, two groups sprung up to continue supporting BSD. The first of these was NetBSD, whose primary goal was to support as many different architectures as possible, everything from your microwave oven all the way up to your Cray XMP. In fact, today, NetBSD supports nearly 60 architectures. The other group that sprang up was FreeBSD. Their goal was to bring up BSD and support as wide a set of devices as possible on the PC architecture. They also had a goal of trying to make the system as easy to install as possible to, to attract a wide group of developers. I chose to work primarily with the FreeBSD group, both doing software and also, together with George Neville Neal, writing this book, The Design and Implementation of the FreeBSD Operating System. Together with this book, I have developed a course, which runs for 12 chapters and 30 hours. The purpose of this video is to give you a taste of that course. What follows are excerpts from the first lecture of the course, which of course you can also get from my website www.mcusick.com. Enjoy! <laughs> this class is nominally about FreeBSD because, well, that's what I know best, uh, and that's what the textbook is organized around. But the fact of the matter is that it's really a class about Unix, and that really covers sort of the broad range of things in the open source arena as it's FreeBSD and Linux, which, of course, you use a lot of. And uh, it also covers the commercial systems, uh, Solaris, HP UX, uh, AIX, and so on. I, going to tend more towards the open side, open source side of things. So it's really going to be more FreeBSD and Linux than it's going to be uh, Solaris and HPUX and so on. Uh, for the most part, at the level of this course, we're dealing with the interfaces to the system. And the fact of the matter is that those interfaces are highly standardized at this point. And whether it's FreeBSD or Linux or Solaris or whatever, the socket system call has to do the same thing. It has to have the same arguments and it has to have the same effect. And so until you get down into the really nitty details of how they actually go about implementing that, the differences are relatively minor. So I would say that 60 to 70 percent of the material that I'm covering is just as true for FreeBSD as it would be for Linux or for uh, Solaris. Uh, AIX is a little bit sort of off in the weeds, uh, as is HPUX, but uh, luckily we don't have to worry too much about that. Okay, so uh, the other thing is that I'm going to assume that all of you have used the system. I'm, I, I get really sort of worried when people, you know, raise their hand and say, what's a shell? Uh, 
Uh, or if I, I don't put a lot of code up, but I put up one piece of code and someone said, well, why are there two pipe symbols in the middle of that if statement? It's like, no, we're not programming the shell, we're programming in C. So hopefully you can tell the difference between shell scripts and C code and so on. Okay, but I am going to assume that you haven't really looked inside the system. So I'm going to start everything sort of at a very high level. Uh, the problem is, as I've already discovered, you come from a lot of different sort of backgrounds and uh, levels of knowledge. And so uh, the, the way that I find works best to sort of be useful to everybody is a three-pass algorithm. So what I'll do is I'll start, the first pass is a very broad brush, high level uh, description of what's going on. And then I'll go back and I'll go through the same material again, but at a lower level of detail. And then I'll kindly go back and go through at a very niggly low level of detail. And the effect of this is that if you're learning new stuff, as I'm doing the high level thing, you're going to be utterly lost by the time I get to the low level niggly detail. Uh, but since I'm going to do it topic by topic, uh, when I get to the end of one of those really low level niggly details, I'll give you a clue. I'll say, all right, brain reset. I'm starting a new topic. So even if you were completely lost, you can now start listening again because I'm going to get the broad brush out again. Okay, and for those of you that know a lot of this stuff already, you'll probably find the broad brush rather boring. <laughs> and, uh, but by the time we get down to the low level neat detail, I think you'll actually pick up some things that you will find useful and interesting. So uh, in this way, hopefully everybody will get some useful percentage of material out of the course. I'm going to start out by just sort of walking through and, and giving you the, the outline of what we're going to try and do here. Uh, as I say, we're going to go uh, uh, roughly, there's about two and a half hours of lecture, uh, two hours, 40 minutes per week. And uh, so we'll start off this week with an introduction. Uh, this is, as I said, we're going to start from the top and then just start working our way down. So the general thing that I'm going to do is sort of talk about the interface, uh, which is something that you are presumably fairly familiar with since you've worked with that system. And then uh, you have to sort of lay out terminology. Uh, although we use normal English words, uh, they have rather sometimes bizarre meanings compared to their common usage. And uh, so I'll just sort of lay out the terminology, lay out the, the way we talk about how the system is structured. Uh, and this week we'll also talk about the basic services. What is it that the kernel is providing for us? Uh, and then, of course, we'll proceed to dive down in and see how that is done. So here in uh, week number two, uh, we're going to look at the system from the perspective of something that manages processes. One way of looking at the kernel is it's really just a, a resource manager, and the resource that it's managing are things having to do with processes. So we'll look at a process, what the structure of it is, uh, and talk about the different ways that they can be structured. The process can, for example, be an address space. It can have one thread running in it. It can have multiple threads running in it. So we'll talk about sort of the different ways that we, we think of processes. Uh, we'll look at the management of those processes. Uh, we've got, we'll, we'll lay out the bits and pieces that need to be managed uh, and then talk about you know, how we do that. Uh, we'll talk about jails. This is something that you currently find only in FreeBSD. It hasn't made it into uh, Linux yet, although uh, the concept is, is uh, being actively worked on. So my guess is that you will see that uh, fairly soon. Uh, we'll also then talk about scheduling, which is, in essence, how we decide what gets to run, when it gets to run, how long it gets to run, et cetera. Okay. Uh, the week after that, we'll go into virtual memory. Uh, signals aren't really part of virtual memory, but they didn't fit into, the, into next week's material, so I'll just sort of drop that at the beginning. Uh, but the bulk of week three is going to be the management of virtual memory. So we've got a bunch of physical memory. We've got a bunch of processes that are uh, trying to use their address spaces. And we will talk about essentially how you make that all work. It's called virtual memory because it's sort of a cheat. I mean, we, we promise you the world, and then we deliver you as small a number of pages as we think we can get away with. OK, so the first three weeks then essentially get us through uh, looking at the world as if it was all, all about processes. 
Then in week four, we change gears. We say, OK, well, you know, the kernel isn't just all about processes. You can sort of look at it orthogonally. You can say it's really just a giant I.O. switch. It's like a traffic cop that's just managing these, these I.O. streams. And uh, so let's look at it from that perspective. And uh, we'll start with special files. Again, this is sort of the interface. When you talk about Unix systems, you talk about what's normally in slash dev, uh, the, the interface that gets you access to the various I.O. streams that are available. And we'll look at how that's organized and the structure of it, uh, which used to be fairly simple, but in the last decade has gotten incredibly complicated. Uh, we'll also talk about pseudo terminals and job control. Uh, this is about as interesting as watching the grass grow, but unfortunately, it is a, it's a major component of the system. Uh, and especially people that deal with system administration have to know far more about this than they probably ever thought they wanted to. Uh, OK, uh, we'll then continue in week five uh, with the kernel I.O. structure. Uh, we'll start with multiplexing of I.O. The kernel, of course, has done this always. But uh, we're really talking more about how do we export I.O. multiplexing out to user applications. Uh, we'll then move into auto configuration strategy. Uh, auto configuration is what happens typically, or historically, I guess I should say, as the system boots. So all that stuff that comes out about you know, what, what hardware is on the machine and how it's all interconnected, all of that is tied up in auto configuration. And that used to happen just once at boot, but in modern systems today, it's an ongoing process. It happens at boot, but it also happens anytime you plug a new I.O. device in, so PCMCIA card or you remove a disk or you put in a new disk or any sort of activity that changes the, the I.O. structure of the machine, auto configuration has to get fired back up and figure out what's disappeared and clean up and figure out what new has arrived and get it configured in. And then we'll talk a little bit about the configuration of a device driver. Uh, this actually gets into an area that uh, is one, well, I, 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 let me just give it as a bit of advice to the class, uh, especially those of you that work in system administration. Uh, you, learn, you really want to be careful that you don't learn too much about device drivers. Uh, because there's really there's three things that you, it, it's not good to learn about. And if you do learn about it, it's really good to keep it to yourself. Because if you become an expert or viewed as an expert in any of these areas, then you will become the designated stucky for that at your site. And you'll never get to do anything but that. Uh, so uh, the, the, the three things that I highly recommend not learning very much about are device drivers, SunMail configuration files, <laughs> <laughs> or anything having to do uh, with uh, LDAP or uh, anything in, in that general domain. Uh, because, as I say, uh, that, that will become your life's work. And there's other things that you might find a little more interesting. Do you have a question? No, I was just empathizing with your point. OK. Uh, some, one of my students empathizes with my point. Uh, I believe you said you worked on the mail system. <clears throat> uh, so you, you might know something about send mail configuration files, but you don't have to answer that. <laughs> OK. Um, so we're going to talk about what a device driver does and really just sort of the entry points to it. Uh, but we're not going to talk about how you write such a thing, how you debug such a thing, or much of anything about it. I actually used to teach an entire class, believe it or not, about device drivers. Uh, but then I realized the error of my ways. And I have since gone through and made a point of forgetting every slide in that talk. OK. Um, so then we'll move on to uh, the file system. Uh, and as always, we'll start at the high level, talk about the interface. What is it that is exported out of the system? Uh, and then we will start diving down in to see how do we go about implementing that. Uh, so we'll start with the, the so-called uh, block I.O. system. It's historically been called the buffer cache. And you still hear it called that periodically. Uh, the fact of the matter is that there isn't really a buffer cache anymore. There's just one big cache, and it's the VM cache. Uh, and the file system has a view into it, and the processes have a view into it. But at the end of the day, you really don't want the same information on two different pages of memory, because that just leads to trouble. Uh, but 
file systems think they have buffers. And so there's this veneer where we make these things that look like what historically were buffers that really just map into the VM system. But they're still managed in the way that they have been uh, managed historically. Okay, we'll then get down into file system implementation, the local file system, if you will, and uh, into also uh, soft updates and snapshots. Uh, this, for the time being, is something that you see only in FreeBSD. Uh, the alternative to soft updates is journaling, which is uh, more commonly used and is, for example, what's used by ext3. Uh, and so I'll go through soft updates. A lot of the issues in soft updates are the same issues that you have to deal with journaling. You know, what, what is it that we're protecting and how do we go about doing that? And the difference is, is in the detail. Uh, there's actually a paper in the back of your notes if this is something that interests you. Uh, it's a comparison of journaling versus soft updates that was done about five or eight years ago. Uh, and not to spoil the punchline, but the answer is they both work about the same. Uh, Okay, uh, snapshots, again, is something that if uh, you've worked with things like the network appliance box, you're probably quite aware of what snapshots are and how they do or don't work for you. Uh, this is the, the same functionality uh, in the file system uh, implemented in a somewhat different way. Okay, uh, so this uh, week six is really going to be the local file system, you know, the disk connected to the machine that we're dealing with. Week seven, then we get into multiple file system support. So how do we abstract out that file system layer uh, and support multiple file systems at the same time? So for example, in FreeBSD, uh, you can, of course, run with the traditional fast file system. But if you happen to like the Linux file system better or you have to share a disk with a Linux machine, you can run ext2 or ext3, uh, and it will perfectly happily do that. So we will have to look then at how do we provide an interface that we can plug in all these different file systems that we want to support. Uh, another area of which there's been a great deal of growth, at least in code and complexity, is so-called volume management. Uh, so in the good old days, you know, a, di a file system lived on a disk or a piece of a disk, and that was that. But in this day and age, uh, that won't do anymore, so we aggregate disks together by striping them or RAID arraying them or various and sundry other things. And we need a whole layer in the system just to manage those disks. We'll then get to, the as an example of an alternative file system, we're going to talk about the network file system, or NFS. Uh, that's not because this is the world's best remote file system or the cleanest design or any of the thing, properties you might hope that such a class as this one would have, but it's ubiquitous, uh, very widely used, and so we're going to talk about that one. Okay, we'll then once again switch gears in week eight and turn our attention to uh, networking and interprocess communication. Uh, and Again, we'll start from the very top. So we'll go through, we'll go with the concepts, the terminology that gets used. You know, what's the difference between a domain-based addressing and an address domain? You know? uh, we'll go through what the basic IPC services are. Uh, essentially, what are all the system calls that have anything to do with networking? Uh, and uh, just sort of describe what each of them are. And then I'm going to go through a somewhat contrived example that makes use of every one of those interfaces uh, and just to sort of show how they all connect together. Uh, for those of you that work in networking or have done any kind of network programming, uh, if you're looking for a week to miss, week eight's the one to miss because that's the sort of most basic uh, lecture that I'm going to give. Uh, if you're not sure whether or not you need to, to go through that, there's a, one of the papers in the back is an introduction to interprocess communication. Uh, read that paper if you say, yeah, 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 yeah you're done with week eight. Uh, on the other hand, if you don't come to week eight, and then in week nine I say, you know, I call on you and say, all right, you know, what is it uh, that the listen system call does and you can't tell me, you're going to get a demerit. Okay, so then week nine we'll get into the actual uh, networking implementation itself. We go through the system layers as we do in all the other areas, uh, and uh, we will spend a significant portion of that class talking about routing. Uh, routing, uh, for those of you that haven't had the pleasure of dealing with it, is a black art, or at least a dark science. And 
So we'll talk about it uh, from the perspective, first of all, of sort of what are we doing locally within the machine, and then what are some of the bigger strategies that we can use for doing routing, uh, enterprise-wide routing or uh, you know, area-wide routing, something like you know, throughout the state of California, throughout the US, whatever. Uh, this, again, like device drivers, is really just sort of a nickel tour uh, through the, through the, the you know, what, what the choices are, what the, the basic strategies are that are used. Uh, if you're thinking you're going to walk out of here knowing how to set up routing, well, sorry, we're not going to get that far. But uh, you should at least have a pretty good idea of what the issues are and what the general solutions are. Okay, then finally in week 10, well, not finally, but next in week 10, uh, we'll go through the internet protocols, uh, primarily TCP IP. And this is what, what are the algorithms that are used. Uh, and I'm putting a particular emphasis for this particular class on uh, changes that have been made in the protocols to deal with a lot of the sort of attacks that we've been seeing. So SYN attacks and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, rather than just a straight iteration of what the, the actual protocols are. I'll talk primarily about IPv4, uh, but I will also try and talk a bit about IPv6 as well. All right. So the first 10 weeks are sort of the kernel course. And then we've tacked two weeks on at the end to talk about sort of the bigger picture of uh, system tuning and crash dump analysis and that level of thing. Uh, the idea is to really consolidate what we figured out or talked about in the first 10 weeks and how that applies to the tools that we have available to us to look at what the system is doing, analyze what the system is doing, and hopefully improve the, the performance of what the system is doing. Uh, and for the most part, the kind of tuning that I'm talking about is not going in and hack, hack, hacking your kernel. Because the fact of the matter is, most of the time, you can't do that anyway. Uh, so it's more looking at it from the perspective of saying, is this system running badly because it doesn't have enough memory on it? Or is it running badly because it doesn't have enough I.O. capacity? Or is it running badly because the, it's got enough I.O. capacity, but certain drives are being overloaded? Or is it you know, being overrun because we're simply trying to do too much on this machine? Etc. So that's the sort of level of thing that we're looking at, but tied into a lot of the concepts that we've had before. So we can talk about active virtual memory and what that means and you know, essentially measure what it is. And hopefully then you'll understand in the context of what we talked about in the VM section what that really means. Uh, the crash dump analysis is, is one of these topics that you're going to either love or hate. Uh, if, if you actually have to deal with crash dumps, it's, people find it invaluable. And if you don't have to deal with crash dumps, it's an incredible mass of boring detail. Uh, the only good part of it is that the, the whole session is only about an hour long. So if it interests you, listen closely. And if it bores you, well, it's only an hour long. OK, uh, lastly, we'll talk a little bit about security issues. Again, this is really more the tools that are available to deal with security stuff as opposed to a complete tutorial on how to implement security. So again, those of you that deal with security, this is just going to be sort of security 101. Uh, uh, for those of you that have, you know, you all have to deal with it, but haven't really thought about it, uh, it'll probably scare you to death, and you'll wonder how you keep the machines from being hijacked every day. OK, so that's, in essence, what we're going to try and do here. Uh, Anybody have any comments, questions, thoughts? Nope. All right. Well, let's get started. We will begin on page 15 with an overview of the kernel. Hopefully, nobody's lost yet. What's a kernel? All right. So starting at the very top, the big broad brush, what we have is a Unix virtual machine. And virtual machines are actually something that have been around as a concept since the 60s. The difference is really just sort of the level of the interface that people have dealt with when they talk about virtual machines. In the 1960s, computers were these enormous things. So you would have, your computer room would be something that would be 
you know, sort of three times the size of this conference room if you had a computer. The computer itself was as tall as a refrigerator freezer. Uh, imagine, you know, five or eight or ten of these units side by side. That itself made up the computer. There would be one bay which would be, you know, sort of the core processor and then one which would be the floating point unit and several of them that would be the memory, the core memory, literally core memory. Uh, and then there'd be other rows of these disk drives, which were this, about the size of a washing machine. Uh, and then behind that, since you couldn't store everything on disk, uh, they, you had rows of tape drives. And then you had this little set of sort of munchkins that would run around and, and tend to the machine. And they'd mount tapes and take off tapes and mount disk packs and remove disk packs. Because the, the drives themselves were very expensive. And so you wouldn't just, as today, have a, a thing that was you know, one spindle that was dedicated just to one set of platters, you could take out a set of platters and put in, you know, another, you know, 100 megabyte set of platters. You know, these are platters that are this big around, and there's like six or eight of them, and giant head assemblies that come rumbling in and out. Uh, at any rate, one of these giant, giant machines uh, that cost many millions of dollars uh, would run at about 10 million instructions per second, 10 MIPS. Uh, and 10 MIPS was more computing power than anybody could possibly imagine using in a single application. Uh, you know, just by contrast, you know, this, this four-year-old laptop here is, is probably on the order of one or 200 MIPS. Uh, but uh, at any rate, people couldn't really view what we would do with all that computing power. Uh, and the other thing was that you didn't have a notion of sort of an operating system that had applications running on it because uh, everybody wanted to write straight to the raw hardware. And so what IBM, who was the big uh, manufacturer of machines in those days, uh, did was they came up with this thing called VM. And this was a little, you'd call it an operating system, really. But what it did is it cloned independent copies of the machine that looked just like the original machine. So you could boot something that thought it was an operating system uh, on top of VM. And so it would take one of these 10 MIP machines and it would clone six identical 1 MIP copies. So I have a little overhead there. Uh, and then you could boot whatever you wanted on each one of those machines. So if you were doing database stuff, you'd boot your database because the database ran on the raw hardware. Or if you were doing payroll, you booted the payroll program. Uh, or you, if you were actually trying to service users, you could boot a time-sharing batch thing that would you know, read card images and print stuff out. Or they even had TSO, the time-sharing option, where you could interactively sit and type and send stuff in and get answers back. Uh, and uh, so you could boot TSO. So whatever set of uh, things you needed, you could boot them. And they ran independently as if they were running on their own machine. But all that VM did was gave you the, an exact raw copy of the hardware. So when Unix came along, they sort of liked the notion of you know, providing sort of the concept of independent things that you could operate in, but they wanted it at a higher level. So we were looking really to do it, instead of at the raw hardware level, to do it at a process level. And the idea then was that the, the interface that you'd program to would be what we think of as a system call interface today. And the idea then was that you would be given a process or a set of processes, and those were independent. You know, you, your process couldn't affect the address space of another process. You couldn't reach over and mess around with their addresses. You couldn't mess around with their I.O. channels. Uh, you could slow them down by being a pig, but that was about the only way that you could affect other processes. And uh, so what the, the interface that they then had there uh, was one that had these characteristics. You had a, a paged virtual address space. So you didn't have to know, as in the old days, how much physical memory was on the machine and make your application fit into that amount of memory. You just had what looked like a large uniform address space, even if the underlying hardware had segments or some other hardware brain damage. Uh, it looked to you like you just had a big uniform address space. And the size of your address space was independent of the amount of memory that was on the machine. Your address space could be bigger than the amount of physical memory because we'd sort of move pages around underneath whatever part of your address space was actually active. Now, there's obviously limits to this if you, if you are trying to run a one gigabyte application on top of 10 megabytes of memory. It's probably going to bring new meaning to same-day service. But if you're willing to wait long enough, it will eventually you know, move the pages around and, and you will progress through getting your application run. Uh, another thing was uh, dealing with software interrupts. Uh, in the old days, you had to understand how the hardware worked uh, 
in order to deal with exceptional conditions. So for example, if you did a divide by zero, the, the hardware would you know, jump through some vector location or something. Uh, and you had to know how that worked and make sure that you had your program, usually some little bit of assembly language, set up to deal with that. And Unix said, let's, let's, let's get away from the hardware here. And so they did this thing called signals. And so they just define a set of signals. If you do a divide by zero, um, you simply register a routine that you want to have called. And you don't have to know how the hardware figured it out. You just know that that routine is going to get called and you can deal with it at that point. Uh, we got a set of timers and counters to keep track of what we're doing. This is really more for accounting than anything else, but applications may want to have access to that. We have a set of identifiers that we're going to use for things like accounting and protection and scheduling and so on. And one of the, the early philosophies of Unix was to try and keep it simple. Uh, operating systems had gotten very Baroque. Uh, in particular, the thing that predated Unix was a thing called Multics. Uh, Multics was, was a joint project between Honeywell, a big computer manufacturer of the time, uh, AT&T Bell Laboratories, a big industrial laboratory at the time, and MIT, a big university then and still today. Uh, and the, those three organizations got together to try and build this time-sharing operating system. And it, it just got bigger and more grandiose and more complex and never finished. Because as soon as they'd sort of see, oh, well, we know how to do that, but we could do this other thing too. And so then they'd tear it all apart and uh, they never really got to something that, that could be put into production. And so the AT&T uh, Bell Laboratories decided to pull out of that project. And uh, the two of the people that had been working on that project, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, uh, were sort of bummed because they were now back to typing cards and putting them through card readers. And they'd sort of gotten used to the idea that you could actually sit at an ASR33 teletype and interact with your computer. And so, uh, they found an old uh, PDP-8 sitting off in the corner that had been abandoned and started working on this little tiny operating system, which they called Unix, uh, which eventually moved to the PDP-11 and became uh, what we have today. But because it was, they were coming, first of all, from Multics, where everything had been done in, gr in great grandiose detail, and because there fundamentally were two of them working on it, and they wanted to get something done in within a year or so, one of their philosophies was, let's find the one way of doing things. Let's not have eight ways from Sunday. Let's just get the one way. And then that's what we will provide. So what's the sort of core set of, of things that we need? Well, the first thing is, uh, when it comes to identifiers, let's not have you know, 80,000 different identifiers. So they came up with process identifiers, user identifiers, and at that time, a single group identifier later expanded. Uh, and they use that set of identifiers for everything. So it's used for accounting, it's used for protection decisions, it's used for scheduling decisions. And uh, again, it was the simplicity of the thing which was what was driving their decision. But there were really sort of two key ideas that they had that, that really made the difference, that, that sort of set them aside from what everybody else had done before them, and which in retrospect is something that has been pervasive more or less ever since. The first of these was the notion that we have a unique descriptor space. Uh, that is, given a descriptor, it can, it can reference any I.O. device, so, or even any kind of I.O. channel. So you can have a descriptor for a terminal, or a descriptor for a file, or a descriptor for a disk, or a descriptor for a pipe, or a descriptor for a socket. And you don't need to know what it references in order to be able to read and write that thing. So if, some, if I hand you a descriptor, you can read from that descriptor, you can write to that descriptor, and the correct thing will happen. And you'd say, well, that's so obvious. I mean, how else would you possibly think about doing it? Well, predating Unix, everything was done with uh, its own little subsystem. So there was open a file, read a file, write a file, close a file. And then there was another set of system calls, which was open a terminal, read a terminal, write a terminal, close a terminal. And yet another one, which was you know, create a pipe, read a pipe, write a pipe, and so on. So if you're just a drop-dead stupid program like, say, CAT, uh, you would have to have code in there and say, well, is my input a terminal, in which case I need to use the read terminal? Uh, or is it a file, in which case I need to use read file? Or is it a pipe, in which case I need to use read pipe? 
And so the program itself had to have all this coding in it. Whereas when they went to a uniform descriptor space, it cat doesn't know and doesn't need to know. It just says, read my input, write the output. And that it, it works. You know, we add a new type of descriptor, and cat just continues to work just as it always did. So this proved to be a very powerful construct. And pretty much every operating system after Unix uh, did that. There's one exception of a large company in the Pacific Northwest uh, that still has a not quite uniform descriptor space. But uh, that's part of their legacy that really they're working on that. Longhorn will be here. Uh, at any rate, uh, this set of facilities then makes up uh, the, the Unix virtual machine. And uh, in some sense, we, we still see virtual machines being used today. In fact, we're seeing sort of a reversion uh, back to some of the IBM stuff in things like VMware, um, which is uh, essentially allowing you to go back to booting native operating systems again. So it's sort of interesting to watch the, the, the sort of uh, pendulum effect going back and forth of what's the correct layer uh, for, for doing uh, virtual machines. Okay, so far so good. All right, so I said that there were two real key ideas that Unix had, the first of these being the uniform descriptor space. The second one, which was really critical, was this notion of processes as a commodity item. So here on page 17, I've sort of laid out the, the, the components that make up a process. Uh, and what do I really mean when I say a process as a commodity item? Well, again, leading up to Unix, the systems that predated it, processes were these very large, heavyweight, expensive things. And uh, so if you look at MVS, which was the operating system that ran on IBM for doing multiple processing, uh, the system administrator would decide at boot time what degree of multiprocessing they wish to support. So they'd say, well, we'll let up to six things happen at once. And so as part of booting up, that would create six processes. And now you as a user, if you wanted to do something, let's say you wanted to compile and run a program, uh, you would be given a process. And it was up to you to figure out how to stage what you needed done. And uh, th this was often fairly complex. Uh, and so you would have to write out all the steps that you wanted in this wonderful thing called JCL, Job Control Language. Job control language was the send mail configuration file of the 60s. Uh, there were people whose sole job at the company was how to put this stuff together. Because all you had to do was get like one extra space or a missing comma or something in there. And the whole thing would just blow up. It would just sort of spit the card deck back out at you and say, well, somewhere in there is a mistake sort of in the general area of this card. And I can't deal with it. Fix it. And of course, in those days, it wasn't just a matter of hitting carriage, you know, make carriage return. You had to get your deck and pull out the card and type a new one and put it back in and resubmit it because, heaven forbid, you couldn't touch that, that card reader. You know, it had to be done by an operator. And so the card deck would read through and it would disappear. And then, you know, if you were lucky a few minutes later and if you were not lucky a few hours later, you would get a, print, a printout, uh, which was what had happened. And then you could look at it and, you know, oh, I put a comma in the wrong place. I guess I get to do it all again. So when the, the thing you would need to do there is, if for is compiling and running a program was you'd have to break it into these steps. So you'd say, all right, well, I need to run the preprocessor. And so uh, clean out whatever gunk was left over in that process from the previous user, put the preprocessor in there, uh, and then read from this file here. And let's see, I've got to put it somewhere. So create a scratch file over on this disk. And you had to give all this excruciating detail, like how many cylinders and how many tracks and how many this and that and blocks and blah, blah, blah. And don't forget any of those parameters, because it'll spit it out if you do. And so then it would run the first step. And if that ran to successful, then you'd have sitting in this scratch file that you'd created the, the output of the preprocessor. And then you'd load the first pass of the compiler. And you'd say, all right, now read from that scratch file and create this other scratch file over here. And when that's successful, then we needed to delete that one and then load the second pass and put that in back into another scratch file. And then we run the assembler and the optimizer and the loader and this and that. And finally, run the program. And uh, if all goes well, you know, at step 16, out comes your answer, 42. So uh, Unix 
said, look, this is silly. There's a lot of this is just bookkeeping, and computers do bookkeeping really well. And people are like, oh, yeah, but it's going to take all these cycles. It's like, uh, that's, you know, computers are supposed to be labor-saving devices, right? So uh, anyway, they came up with this notion that they would create processes on the fly as needed. So if you had, you know, you had a preprocessor and two steps of the compiler and the optimizer and assembler and a loader, we'd just create, boom, seven processes, and we'd connect them together with pipes. And so we'd take the input and, you know, we'd run through and through the pipes and, you know, out the end you'd get the, the executable. And we would simply create each of these processes. And uh, so you as a user just typed, you know, C compiler. And it, it just forked these things, piped them together, got the result. And uh, then when it was done with those processes, it just threw them away. So anytime you'd create a new process, you, it came to you pristine clean. And if you needed a bunch of things, you didn't have to put everything in intermediate files. Now, the fact of the matter is, in the early days, those computers didn't really have enough memory to support all that stuff at once. So, in fact, behind you, those pipes were actually implemented as files. Uh, but you didn't at least have to remember to create them and delete them and deal with them. As far as you were concerned, it just looked like stuff was flowing through pipes. And, of course, today it just does flow through pipes in memory. Okay, so this notion then that we're just going to create processes on the fly as needed and connect them together as needed uh, it was a novel concept. And it wasn't that they'd somehow m mysteriously figured out how to create processes cheaply, because they hadn't. They were still really expensive to create. Uh, but it, the, you know, that extra effort was worth it because it was saving a lot of programming time. So you know, my favorite example is you run LS. Uh, so we have to create a process, load the LS binary into it, it prints a line or two on your screen, and then we tear the entire thing down and, and return all its resources back to the system. More than 90% of the cost of running LS is creating and destroying the process. A tiny fraction of it is actually running LS. But it, it goes so fast, I mean, who cares, right? It's, so the, the point is that uh, that concept of just creating things as needed, uh, again, was very powerful and is one that is just pervasive today. Okay, so what is a process actually made up of? Uh, it gets some amount of CPU time, or at least we dearly hope that it gets some amount of CPU time. It's the lack of getting CPU time that makes it appear so sluggish, of course. Uh, this really boils down to scheduling, and we're going to talk about scheduling probably more than you care to uh, in a couple weeks' time. We have the asynchronous events. Uh, these are the external events that are coming in. Uh, so they may be either things that are coming in from the outside world, like start and stop and quit, uh, out-of-band data arrival notification, that kind of thing. Or it may, in fact, be things that the program is bringing down upon itself, uh, such as a segment fault, a divide by zero, uh, some other what would normally be viewed as incorrect operation. And so we'll talk about that when we talk about signals. Every program uh, gets some amount of memory. Uh, it gets an initial amount when it starts up and generally allocates more as it goes along. Uh, this, of course, we will deal with uh, very extensively. We'll spend an entire week on it uh, when we talk about how virtual memory gets implemented. And uh, then we get I.O. descriptors. I used to say that every program had to have at least one I.O. descriptor, since if it did, had absolutely no input and absolutely no output, then it was sort of pointless. Uh, of course, I had to have one of my students come up and point out to me that there is a class of programs which don't need I.O. descriptors. And that is these things called benchmarks. They just compute something, and all we really care about is how long it takes them to compute. We don't actually care what the answer is. Well, in theory, we don't. I personally sort of like my benchmarks to output something so I can see that they're doing, computing the right thing. But in theory, uh, that wouldn't be necessary. Okay, outside of that class of programs, everything needs some set of descriptors. And of course, we'll talk about descriptors quite extensively uh, as we go through the I.O. subsystem. Okay, so the, the executive summary is that processes are the fundamental service that is provided by Unix. And uh, 
what we're going to spend essentially the next two and a half weeks working on is what, what makes up processes. I mean, we'll go into much more detail on each of these four points. And uh, then how do we actually go about providing that bit of service? The next thing that I'm going to do now is to just go through and lay out some of the terminology that uh, we have with when we're talking about processes. So this is sort of the big picture here. We're on page 18. And uh, you can see we have sort of three bits that make up a, the, the system. We have the, the currently running user process, then what we call the top half of the kernel, and the bottom half of the kernel. Now, this would be a picture for a uniprocessor. So one CPU. Uh, if we had a multiprocessor, uh, then we would have uh, sort of one instance of the kernel, but multiple instances of the user process. But for any given CPU on a multiprocessor, uh, it is running exactly one process. So you may think that we're running four or five processes all at once, but the fact of the matter is at any instant in time, there is only one process which is actually running. And uh, that is the one that we have loaded into the system. Now we give the illusion that we're running lots of things because we switch between them rather quickly. So it looks like things are happening in all your windows at once, but in reality, uh, that's not really happening. OK, so there's a set of properties that I want to look at uh, having to do with each one of these parts here. Um, but you know, just to sort of look at it from the big picture perspective, what you see here is uh, there's this boundary between the user process and the top half of the kernel, which is really just like a glorified subroutine call. It's a lot like calling into a library routine, so calling stir cat or stir copy or something like that. Uh, when you do a system call, uh, we take that same set of parameters. Now, there's this sort of uh, brick wall here, if you will, that is protecting the, the top half of the kernel from the application. Uh, and we'll go into some detail about how that actually gets implemented. Uh, but in essence, you can think of it as, as there's sort of this wailing wall, and there's little chinks there, and you can sort of push your request through, and somebody on the other side sort of pulls it out and looks at it and decides whether they're going to deign to provide service to you. Uh, and if they do, then they sort of send it back. Um, unlike a library where you can just sort of reach in and muck around if you want to. You, I mean, good programming practice says you don't do that, but uh, you could. All right, so the, the top half of the kernel is really looks a lot like a big library. Uh, it just happens to be a library of routines that deal with things where processes need to interact with each other. Uh, in fact, for many people, they don't understand sort of what's the difference between the C library and the top half of the kernel. Uh, if it's something that you're doing that no other process needs to know about, then it can be in the C library. So if you call stircat to concatenate two strings together, nobody else needs to know you're doing that. You don't need to coordinate with anybody else that you're doing that. It's just happening. So that goes in the C library. On the other hand, if you're reading or writing a file, there may be other processes that are also reading and writing that file. And therefore, that has to be done by the kernel because it can coordinate uh, the different processes that are trying to access that file. So the top half of the kernel is pretty straightforward code. It looks a lot like any other library that you would write. If you look at top half kernel code, you know, you see, oh, read, we come in, it's got these parameters, we muck around, we get some data, we put it in the buffer, we return back. Uh, and in fact, writing code for the top half of the kernel is not all that difficult to do. Uh, it's, you know, you have sort of many of the same properties that you would when you were writing user level application code. The bottom half of the kernel is where things start to get nasty. Because the bottom half of the kernel is the part of the system that deals with all of the asynchronous events in the system. Uh, it is things like device drivers, timers, uh, that level of thing that are driven by hardware events. So for example, a packet arrives on the network that causes an interrupt to come in. That will be managed by the bottom half of the kernel. And historically, uh, when an interrupt came in, it preempted whatever else was going on, and it ran until it finished, and then it returned. And it could not go to sleep to wait for resources or other things. Uh, in current systems, you can actually go to sleep in an interrupt driver and wait for some other activity to complete. It is, however, 
not a good idea to do that because the usual case of most device drivers is they can finish whatever they're doing in an interrupt without ever blocking. And so when an interrupt comes in, we assume that you're not going to sleep. And if you actually then go to sleep, we go, oh, man, you didn't tell us you were going to do this. And we have to go off and do a whole lot of other work that we hadn't originally planned on doing. Uh, so if you go to sleep in a device driver, you are taking a very serious performance hit. So it's highly recommended that you don't do that, but if you have to, you can. Um, it's because of this historic behavior of not being able to sleep in the bottom half of the kernel that you have certain properties that have uh, taken over in device drivers. And that is that a device driver should be handed all the resources it needs to get its job done. You don't give a disk device driver thing saying, oh, go read this and put it somewhere. Uh, you have to say, go read this particular block. Here is a chunk of memory that I want that data put in and you know, notify me when it's done. Because things like allocating memory are classic places where you end up having to go to sleep to wait for stuff to happen. And you don't, historically, you couldn't do that. And even currently, you don't want to have to do that. So device drivers generally have all their resources pre-allocated, and then they can just go. The one place where this doesn't work is the network. And in particular, you don't know when somebody's going to send packets to you. You can say, well, you look at your open connections. But if you're doing something like IP forwarding, there's no top half state that's dealing with those packets. They're just coming in on one interface, being sent out on another interface. They never pass through any part of the top half of the kernel. And so in the case of, of network device drivers, they need to allocate memory. And if memory gets into short supply, and they try and allocate memory, and it's not available, they historically couldn't wait for memory to be available. And even in practice today, don't wait if for memory to become available. They simply drop the packet on the floor. It's like, well, I didn't have any place to put it. Sorry, oops. Now, that doesn't cause incorrect behavior, because the higher level protocols will retransmit. But it does cause great performance problems, because retransmissions means that connections stall. They have to back up. They have to resend data, and so on. So you really want to avoid dropping packets if you can possibly help it. And consequently, uh, we tend to pre-allocate a certain amount of memory for the network drivers. Uh, and we, we try very hard to make sure that we're not going to run out of memory. But you know, if packets come fast enough and we can't deal with them as quickly as they're arriving over a short period of time, we get to the point where we have to simply start dropping packets. OK, this is the part of the kernel you do not wish to write code for because it is extremely difficult to debug. You get these bugs where the only time it happens is on the third Tuesday when there's a full moon, and we have a disk interrupt followed by a, a terminal character coming in and a network packet arriving of size 1522. And when all those things happen, the system panics. And of course, there's like, you're, and, you, and it panics because you're following some bad pointer of something that should have been there but was freed sometime in the distant past. We're not sure when. And trying to debug things like that is extremely difficult. I mean, you can think, well, I think I found the problem, but it's not reproducible. You know, you have to wait for the next third Tuesday with a full moon and blah, blah, blah to happen. And you know, so you, you, you sort of statistically guess that you fixed it. You know, I was getting this bug once every three days, and now it's gone for two weeks without happening. Did you fix it? Or have you been lucky? And uh, it's th that coupled with the fact that you're dealing with hardware. And hardware rarely works the way it's documented to work. And so even though you're doing everything that it says you're supposed to do, it still doesn't work because you didn't set the fiddle bit over on that other place over there that's not documented anywhere. But if it's not set, it doesn't work occasionally. So uh, this is another reason that you really want to avoid uh, dealing with this part of the system if you can possibly help it. OK. But uh, let's go through and, and look at some of the properties here. Starting up at the user process, um, we're running with preemptive scheduling. Uh, now, there's several caveats here. Preemptive scheduling is the default or so-called share scheduler 
that is what you normally use. There are other schedulers like the real-time scheduler where what I'm saying isn't true. Um, and we'll talk about some of those other schedulers later. But the usual scheduler that you're running on under Unix is a share scheduler. And under the share scheduler, user applications run with preemptive scheduling. And preemptive scheduling means that you run at the whim of the system. If it wants you to run, you run. Once you start running, you have no guarantee of how long you're going to run. It might let you run for three instructions and then decide it doesn't like you anymore and it wants to run something else. Or you might get to run for several seconds in, in a row with, with no intervening things interrupting you. You just don't know. And uh, really, all you know is that uh, uh, they claim that they're using statistics and, and, and that the statistics are fair. And so on average, you're going to get a reasonable amount of time. But that's up to the system. You don't control that. The real point here is that you, you don't have any way of creating a critical section. You can't say, OK, I don't want to be interrupted during this particular sequence of things. So you have to program assuming that you may be interrupted at any point. OK. The next thing is that when you're running in a user process, you are running in with the processor in what's called unprivileged mode. One of the requirements for running any kind of a Unix system is that you have to have a processor that supports privileged and unprivileged, two different modes of operation. In privileged mode, which is what the kernel runs in, the entire repertoire of the hardware is available. By this, I mean you can set all the registers. You can fiddle with the memory management unit. You can initiate I.O. You can access any memory anywhere. Uh, et cetera. When you're running in, priv in unprivileged mode, which is what user processes run in, there's a large subset of the instructions which you cannot execute. You cannot initiate I.O. on devices. You cannot change the memory mapping. You cannot access memory that's not part of your address space. Uh, you cannot execute certain instructions like halt. Uh, and uh, so in general, you are protected from manipulating anything that's outside of your address space. And this, of course, is desirable because uh, when you're running in this unprivileged mode, you're protected from other processes manipulating you, and they are protected from you manipulating them. Uh, for those of you that uh, had the misfortune to have to use early versions of Windows up through about 98, they always ran with the, the processor running in privilege mode, even in applications. And so either maliciously or accidentally, you could stomp on other people's address space. You could stomp on the kernel. And a lot of the blue screen of death was people just following wild pointers and trashing different parts of the system, taking everything down. Uh, it also makes it far easier to implement things like viruses and worms and other things because a user application can rewrite the boot block on the disk. They can just go right down and manipulate the registers that allow them to do whatever they want. Whereas when you're running in unprivileged mode, you simply can't write those kinds of, of things. So modern versions of, of Windows, anything from about 2000 on, now run with privileged and unprivileged mode. But Unix has always required that. And so when you're running in the user process, you cannot block. And by this, I mean you cannot execute the instructions which cause a context switch to occur. You can't pick what's going to run next. You can't make that thing run next. All you can do is go to the operating system and say, hey, I've got nothing to do. Pick somebody else to run. And the operating system is the thing that can then execute the instructions which cause a different process to be loaded and run. All right. And finally, uh, while you're in a user application, you're running on a user stack that's part of the user's address space. So. Part of creating your processes, we give you a runtime stack. That's part of your virtual address space. And so it can be more or less up to the limits of the hardware as big as you want it to be. So if you're running on a 32-bit processor, your stack can get to 2 gigabytes. And uh, th what this means is that anytime you allocate local variables, you don't have to worry about, oh, well, you know, is that going to overrun my stack? So if you need 100,000 double precision floating point numbers, you can just, as a local variable, allocate an array of size 100,000 type double. And it just decrements your stack pointer by 800,000 bytes. And away you go. It's just virtual address space. As you'll see when we get in the kernel, that ceases to be the case. <coughs> 